Welcome. I'm so glad that you're here to continue this insightful conversation about advancing diversity, equity, inclusion throughout the entire employee experience. My name is Jamie Klein, and most importantly, I hope that all of your loved ones are staying healthy during this time. As context, I'm the founder and CEO of Inspire HR. We're a team of 30 plus HR experts that help company with kind of all HR things under the sun training interim uh, experts to cover openings, compensation, benefits, etc. cetera, um, lots of leadership. And we really are hearing from tons of clients, no matter their size, no matter their industry. It's a, it's a complicated time. So if you're feeling overwhelmed, you, you are not alone between return to office and all of the focus on um, deepening the remote experience um, and this long overdue focus as a country for us to re-engage around how to create more um, racial equity and certainly do so within our organizations. Um, it's, it's a lot and I've said many times it's like a triathlon for HR and it definitely um, can take an emotional toll on all of us who so just want to hold space for, for that. And that is why we created this webinar series called Redesigning the Future of Work so that no one is alone. The series is designed to bring together folks to um, serve as experts and share information um, and really crowdsource ideas and create a sense of camaraderie within the HR community. Last month, we had a fabulous conversation around DEI through the entire employee experience, um, recruiting, revamping leadership programs uh, through a DEI lens, et cetera. And today we're going to very much continue that conversation with three of our esteemed Inspire experts. Um, so a warm welcome um, to our three panelists. Um, Dave Siliberto is an educator and consultant in DEI um, between his fantastic work with uh, Cornell's ILR School and working with tons of leaders at a C-suite um, level. He focuses on connecting the business case, which is what he always refers to as the marketplace, the workplace, and the workforce to make sure that DEI is really woven um, through an intersectional lens throughout the entire um, organization. Sandra Garcia, she combines both DEI, leadership, and sales marketing to execute and create um, various programs that have helped companies such as Toyota, Estee Lauder, Sephora, Pepsi, Amex. It's like the who's who list. Um, she's a recognized speaker on intersectional um, issues, and she also is the founder of consulting agency EncounterYourPotential.com and AfroLatinaBeauty.com. Check it out. These are online destinations for stories of Afro-Latinas to share about their intercultural experiences. And Ricky Jasper, he's a senior leader who uh, had a 30-year career at the CIA in Washington. Um, um, in that role, spending multiple business functions, but eight of those years were spent within DE&I for the agency. Um, he served as a senior executive and special advisor to the director of the CIA on DI plans and programs in addition to training folks of all levels um, on leadership, career development, et cetera. He also led in his free time a strategic talent resource management office, which was very much set up to oversee the entire employee life cycle um, lens um, with an eye towards DEI. So again, quite the crew. I'm thrilled that we gathered for part one of this conversation in August and there was so much energy around um, the dialogue and so many questions in the chat we couldn't get to that we wanted to reconvene uh, here in the month of September. So teams are always, um, you know, we as a team are always leaning on data and kind of proven best practices to kind of spark creativity in our work um, with our clients. So I wanna start um, with the whole case for de &I, and that's very much something that came up last time, like that business case and how's an HR leader, you can go to your leadership and, and really make the business case for it. So um, research from our friends at McKinsey have found that companies with more racially and ethnically diverse workforces are 35% more likely to have financial returns above the median than those in their industry. And for every 10% increase in racial and ethnic diversity in the leadership team as a whole, um, research has shown a 1% growth in revenue. So we always like to kind of call out that McKinsey study. The other study that we always reference is out of Harvard. So you know, a glaring reason um, for this correlation is that DEI powers innovation, kind of let's group think, if you will. And researchers from Harvard found that companies with more overall diversity in leadership and, and thought are 70, 
percent more likely to capture new markets um, than the more homogenous peer companies that are out there. So um, can't go um, to any place other than uh, Harvard and McKinsey to kind of look for that data. And we reference this all the time with our clients because sometimes you are introducing DEI as a new concept for the top of the house and um, those metrics really help. So with that, Dave, let's kick it off and let's start with you. Um, I would love to hear from you, you know, what are ways that you've seen greater inclusivity drive business results and higher functions within a team? Okay, great. Well, first of all, it's an honor to be here again with my esteemed colleagues and all of the participants. So thank you. Um, you, you know, metrics and data really critical. Um, and what we're looking at is how do we measure what we want to measure and how do we even figure that out? So a lot of organizations do this. Uh, we partner with Dandy and what they look at at Dandy is the intersectional data right at many different levels it's it's deep and it's wide so we need to consider those experiences of the intersectional lens and the way to do that is number one tackle employee resource groups employee resource groups are the culture of the company and when you have misses or obstacles and barriers for your demographic in the organization you tap into the employee resource groups because they are hence the name resource a resource to the organization to provide you with feedback on what's going well and what's not going well, which then is also combined in the employee engagement survey, a data point, but also focus groups. So you get to dissect what people were thinking when they're answering the questions and giving you a lower score than you had anticipated. And, and all the work that we do in Inspire and elsewhere, usually um, we end up surprising you know, um, our clients with more negative than positive because of the diversity of the intersectional lens on who I am and what obstacles I have faced in the organization. And that leads to how transparent are you with your processes and structures, meaning mobility, what's it take to move around? Promotion, how do I get it? How are we hiring? So the clearer the criteria based on competencies and skills and deliverables, the more transparent it is and the less bias that comes into play. Um, and I'll just mention one article Harvard Business Review had, when employees think their boss is unfair, turnover is 38% in an organization. And what's not happening is finding the barriers for the intersectional lens. So once we do know the barriers, now we act on it. So this is a great article and it's in the chat um, for Harvard Business Review, but that's a data point that I use a lot. Great, great, fantastic. Oh great, and I'm thrilled that it's in the chat so folks can reference it and bring it to their leadership teams, right? Um, as you know, I always say I'm a firm believer of what gets measured gets done. Um, so I'd love to hear from all of you, know, what are some accountability structures that you've seen work particularly well? Yeah, so uh, Jamie, again, thank you so much. Uh, it is great to share time and space with this amazing, powerful, intelligent team. And um, I just wanted to piggyback uh, on the previous question and then I want to jump into this response here. Uh, and I love that you also started sharing the McKinsey study in showing a direct correlation in inclusion and diversity to revenue growth. And I think that right now, uh, brands are very much being a lot more conscious of reflecting the worlds that they serve. And we saw some brands have an okie doke and oops moments like H&M. Mm -hmm. We saw brands like Prada and Gucci have oops moments as well. And one example, uh, Gucci had a great moment and is having a great moment by adding Dapper Dan, who is a respected creative visionary to their lineup. And he was using his vision for fashion in creating almost a completely new marketplace, super undercover for mm -hmm. the brand but by Gucci partnering together with kind of an underground uh, creative visionary, they've been able to create a completely new revenue lane for themselves. And they've also been able to expand and increase an already loyal celebrity consumer base which also increases also your just regular consumer base. So I think that's a great moment in showcasing how inclusivity and diversity can lead to revenue growth. Yeah. Uh, and to just jump in on the second question here about what gets measured gets done. Yes, you're absolutely correct. And a great example of that is the implementation of diversity councils or task forces. 
And going back to Dave and uh, the Harvard Business Review, who came out with a collection of great studies around diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, they have noted that tax forces or companies with tax forces see 90% and a 30% increase in representation in white women, as well as each minority group over the course of five years. And that is powerful. Oh, yes, it is. Ricky, any thoughts from you on creating that kind of accountability within a culture? So, so one of the things that with regard to accountability and measurement, the, when we finally started having conversation about where we were investing funds uh, with regard to university investments for developing, et cetera, et cetera, it was until we raised the question, raised this statement that we need to take a look at this and started to see where the mon where monies were being invested that we finally realized that we were kind of one-sided in our investments. We were inv investing in majority serving institutions of the sort, but none in minority serving institutions we had, where we had a presidential directive. So just highlighting the fact that this was an issue and looking at what we were doing immediately it created a change. And so people began to, to start doing things differently. So I think, again, just bringing attention to the fact that measuring and leadership involvement in that process made the difference. Absolutely. Um, there, um, I could go on to that question for a long time, but there was another question that came up back in August that I want to tackle here in September. Um, it's critical for organizations to really spur change, but also um, how does change happen from the bottom up? So if you are a Gen Z, brand new, right out of undergrad. How do you become that change that is so needed? I, let, me, let, me, I'll, let me grab that because one of the things that we, we discovered, 9-11 Commission, when it happened, when 9-11 happened, we had a generational change in the organization where we hired a, a host of new millennials into the organization. And what was refreshing about that, they came with energy, ideas, and they got involved and in themselves developing their own council to discuss things that were important to them, to identify ways, you know, they discussed things like the tuition reimbursement, they discussed ways uh, to uh, how they could, should be trained and developed, how they can, they created a mentoring network among themselves, and then that expanded to them uh, connecting with others outside. So they, their involvement in themselves their conversation among themselves began to expand beyond just themselves into the organization where they became an organization where the organization, a group where the organization looked to with questions. And so we started going to them to say, okay, we're thinking about doing this new thing. Okay, what do you think? And they, the ideas, they came up with new systems. And so again, I say, if you wait until you move up in the organization, there's a chance that you may get tainted and become like everyone else. But if you get involved early, you get an opportunity to assimilate your ideas with the rest and you'll just introduce your ideas with the rest as opposed to be assimilated with the rest and then change the organization. So I don't think there's a, a, a requirement for being there a number of years. I think with encouraging, but now let me also mention that the organization must encourage and allow this to happen because if they resist it and fight it, then they quell it and then they create the lack of it, lack of possibility for it happen. But when it happens, it's, it can change the organization in a very positive way. Yep. I always say um, ERGs, employer resource groups, business groups, they're almost like the early detection warning system. Also, if something culturally is off. Right. There is very much in there. Um, Sandra, um, Dave, any other thoughts on how to get that energy and that change from the bottom up in the organization? Yes, absolutely. So during my time at Time Warner, one thing that we did was introduce a think tank. And this was a think tank of interns and then also entry level. Um, I would have to agree with Ricky that this is something that the organization has to encourage. But I was at Time Warner Cable, traditional cable company, and we wanted to learn more about cord cutters. So who do you go to but cord cutters? And who better than to learn from than our interns? So we gather their perspectives. What are you and your friends doing? What's happening on campus? Are you guys signing up for cable or are you not? Are you going directly to Roku, Netflix, and the list goes on? So gathering these perspectives, and I think that also feeds into the importance of diversity of thought and then also diversity of perspectives and helping to also guide business decisions that can absolutely make a big impact on revenue. So going to ERGs uh, at a, an earlier level and maybe collecting thoughts and perspective there that can then feed into organization, uh, organizational decisions, but then also creating think tanks of different groups. 
Right. I love that. Um, I, I'm also feeling like that is such a cultural piece. And Ricky, you touched on that. It has to feel, you know, people need to look up to the top of the house and feel that that is welcome. And um, also it's rewarded, right? Like I've seen some organizations that I've worked at um, bring on the big stage at a town hall, folks at a junior level who came up with the big idea and kind of showcase it. Again, what gets measured gets done and show folks that this is kind of welcome and, um, and acknowledged. Um, I'm going to add in on uh, Jamie, if you don't mind. So one of the things in building on Ricky and Sandra, how you onboard people is critical, which you are creating uh, insight into the unwritten rules of the culture of the organization. So a lot of successful onboarding includes a buddy program for new hires for three months, a mentor, reverse mentoring, mentoring circles, and all these things are vehicles for open communication, open dialogue about ideas and passion and innovation. And, you know, I have to say, we have to thank both Gen Y and Gen Z in the workplace for bringing social responsibility to the forefront. How do you give back as an organization? This is mission driven for generation, for new generations. So tapping into all that innovation from that lens. And yes, it's generational, but it's very intersectional lens. And, you know, Gen Y and Gen Z, we are way more intersectional and multicultural than the previous generations. So we are tapping into a multitude of diversity of thought and innovation now more so than ever before. And it's a big miss if companies don't set up the onboarding properly to engage their employees early on to feel that their voice counts and the vehicles of using their voice. So I think it is an important part based on what Ricky and Sandra said to build the infrastructure in the culture um, for openness. Absolutely. And we spoke back in August about how much energy, time, resources, budget um, go into bringing talent in. But if folks get in and they look around side to side and at the top of the house and there's no one that reminds them of them, however they define them, um, they're not as likely to stay. Um, speaking of staying, a question that came up last time was around pay and so much has unfolded around this in the last 12 months in the U.S., but specifically, what are the three of you seeing companies do to really fix pay inequity? Well, I'll jump in because I, I did mention the firm we partner with, Dandy. Um, they do a very deep dive on the intersectional segmentation regarding pay equity um, and not just an non-aggregated, it's aggregated. So are we looking at comparing similar roles based on gender, similar duration of time, tenure, similar team size, right? Are we comparing apples to apples? And what's the pay gap between male and female for pay equity? And that's, that's a very deep dive into structure of roles, responsibilities, domain, right, that we know what's the percentage difference and why. Um, and again, that's pay equity for salary. We also have to weave in how is compensation determined for bonus structure, right? What's the criteria? So we look at these elements for a very deep analysis and you need the analysis. So if you have people in your organization in the comp department that can do it, awesome. If not, get some help with this because you wanna also benchmark what are the jobs in the marketplace similar to our company paying? so that we do have an aggregate information range that we can actually go into to say, oh, we're, we're really only off by a small percentage versus large. You know, mm -hmm. and now there's other laws in place. So for example, there's um, MIPA, which is Massachusetts Equity Pay Act, and they look at unaggregated data and they just say, compare male and female salaries and what's the average and then what's the gap. And people are very hesitant to do that because if you have a higher percentage of men than women, the gap is gonna be huge. If you have a lower percentage gap, then it's not so much. So it's not really a good determining factor on the role and the pay for the role based on gender and other variables. Mm -hmm. There is, this is an area where there is so much work to be done. Um, Sandra, Ricky, anything to add before we jump to the next question that came up? Okay. No, good, thank you. Just this last weekend, the New York Times published, I think is such an important article um, that's incredibly relevant to our conversation. So I wanted to surface it today. The point came up about how working from home um, can really pose these additional barriers to people of color. 
Um, there is one of my girlfriends calls it the social lubrication, right? You see people at the water cooler, the elevator bank, in the hallways. And that is so much how relationships typically get formed that have nothing to do with role and reporting structure, but more just about um, getting to know people. And I'm wondering if you're seeing any best practices, any proactive things that we can do to make sure that no one person's voice um, is more dominant than others within a team. Yeah, so Jamie, when I heard this question, I thought of you. Uh, and you do something really well for your team, which is that you have a standing meeting on the calendar where everyone is invited, there is no real agenda, and it's a time for everyone to come together, share ideas, or just share how their day is going. And I think that's one way where you can bring people together in a space that has nothing to do with work. You cannot even talk about work and just share space. And mm -hmm. I was going to say, um, to do a shout out, Kulpana, one of our project managers, actually thought of that idea in March. Again, it was just more to share silver linings, like you said. And what has happened over time, it's evolved into kind of um, sharing wisdom about any type of industry trend that's going on and kind of crowdsourcing ideas. So really, until the pandemic, every Friday at 1, we're there. And I always say everyone is the same size in these little you know, Zoom Brady Bunch boxes, right? It's just about folks coming together. So that just might be an idea for folks on the, some of the, um, the participants to maybe implement for their organizations. Right. And we're all reading and also experiencing. People are definitely getting Zoom fatigued. Uh, and then also after a full day of meetings, sometimes that happy hour at the end of the day might just be exhausting and counterproductive. So having kind of something to look forward to, where also women and women of color, you can get your hair ready to be on camera <laughs> versus that spontaneous, hey, can you get on camera in five minutes and who knows what you look like? So just also being sensitive and respectful of the fact that we are also at home uh, and also sharing space with other people in our home and may not always be prepared to be on camera. Absolutely. Yeah, all that. Go ahead. So, so I, was, I would just say with, with the change in the way we work now, it becomes a requirement to ensure that you pay attention to the change impact on your workforce. And this is outside the workforce dynamic, but one of the things we noticed at the church was that people fell off, normal people who were attending church were not attending the Zooms. So we had to come up with new strategies to involve those individuals to bring them into the fold to make sure that they're involved. And workforces, when they make the change, there are some people that are just you know, you're just savvy with regard to the internet. And there are others who are not so much and they do what they have to do. Uh, and then the other reality of our networks that currently exist, we already, we do network with people who we network with, but there are those who are not. And with regard to the DEI, the, those the minorities that are being missed in the process, we have to make sure that we're making, create a space as you've done again to my esteemed colleagues, it's just so good to be with you all today. I'll say it is, it, as you've done so well, we have to just make it a point to create an avenue or a venue for them to be able to connect. Mm -hmm. And that's what this time is, I think, really about. It can feel, um, it's complicated right now to be a human, to be a professional, to be a, a parent, a son, a daughter. It's just complicated to so just to hold space to come together um, so that there's not that sense of um, just loneliness that I think um, so many employees just have, have felt isolated in. Um, but I think that these proactive ideas, I think, are really key. Um, Dave, last time you said something that really stuck with a lot of people, especially our talent acquisition folks that were on, um, where we often hear about diverse candidates um, when what we really mean is a diverse slate of candidates. And you said something that stuck with folks, which is that we're all diverse. Um, and this has me thinking so much about the importance of intersectionality. Um, I'd love to hear from you how intersectionality leads to diversity and more inclusion. Sure, I mean, you know, it, it's really the multiple lens of, of what we see and how we look at our, our experiences inside a workplace and outside a workplace. But, you know, we all are diverse individuals because our backgrounds are different, our lens are different, our experiences, our life experiences, our successes, and they're all different. Um, so, you know, even twins have different lenses based on their own personal experiences. Oh, Ricky's a twin. Um, so, you know, with, with that said, Jamie, it's, it's really tapping into understanding self first, which then I can relate to better to others, which then has an impact in a positive way on an organizational culture. So that 
I am not walking in making assumptions on, on anybody because I really don't know. And even, you know, I am white, I'm gay, I've been out for decades, um, but people don't know that I'm in an interracial relationship, my husband's Latin. So I experience bias with my husband when we're together at times on what people say and do behaviorally. And um, that registers with me along with homophobia, but also on the positive side, how I'm embraced for my lens and how my husband is embraced mm -hmm. from his lens. So mm -hmm. it's just really interesting how we need to figure out ways to tap into sort of understanding that what you see at face value is just a small tip of the iceberg as we do the analogy for diversity, equity, and inclusion. But who I am is the structure of the iceberg underneath the water level. And that is so deep and rich with beliefs and history and experiences and my own culture and cultures. Mm -hmm. So I think programs that we do through Inspire, Cornell and elsewhere, when you do get to tell personal stories mm -hmm. of who you are and what's created your lens, mm -hmm. it makes a huge impact on others to understand you better and to register. And right now, I mean, with everything going on currently is a lot of times, you know, Black Lives Matter is important. And yes, we know all lives matter. And in the training that we do, we're like, yes, but all lives aren't in danger right now, right? So there is focus, there is a priority. We need to, we need to work on Black Lives Matter because we're losing Black lives. Mm -hmm. And it's not at the same rate we're losing all other lives. So let's focus on what's happening to fix it. And then when we wanna do, and we've coached our clients on this is have dialogue right? Zoom dialogues. It doesn't have to be a hundred. It can be small and intimate, but let's listen, learn, support, and then together take action. But this mantra is listen, learn, support. Absolutely. After the murder of George Floyd, I received so many emails, calls from, from leaders, and, and many of them said, Jamie, I'm a white, straight male over 40, I want to do and say the right thing, but I am so nervous to go forward. And I just said to them, you know, I, I know that as a, as a type A person, you want to spring into action, but the most important thing for you to do is to sit so still and sit with this discomfort because only then will you feel it at a, at a cellular level where then when you go to your town hall, when you do listening circles, it will really feel authentic. And then I said, you know, over the weekend, here's like, you know, 12 movies, three TED Talks, and four books that I want you to quickly read just to kind of begin the education. And then with that sense of empathy um, and that, that deeper sense of understanding of systemic racism in our country, can you move forward and help to reimagine the employee experience, reimagine how you can help Black employees, people of color, um, feel comfortable so that they can show up and do their best and stay safe. Um, so on BLM, on Black Lives Matter, you know, there is so much renewed commitment um, around DEI. And unfortunately for those of us who have been in the space for a while, um, we've seen these cycles um, come and go and come and go again. And I am hoping that this time the momentum that is here is um, not a, a movement. I'm sorry, it's not a moment, but it's a movement and it's for keep. But I'd love to hear um, from each of you any strategies, tactics that you've seen to keep that momentum going for an organization. And Ricky, maybe we'll st I'll start with you because I know um, at the agency, you definitely have seen that over the 30 year career. Yeah, we saw when we did the study on this, that there was a cycle of success and, and then comfort and then failure, then success and then comfort. It was constantly going up and down because you, again, you want, you, you, at some point we're talking, you want to hit this mark and do the right thing. So you do the right thing. And so some things were being done. Um, but what we realized is that we can't continue that, that cycle. So identify what was working. And so what grabbed the attention was a real failure. It was like, we look at this, this is obvious, we need to do something about this. But then doing something about it and, and claiming success was basically our failure. So the idea is once you look at identify as an organization, what do we want to be in the future, but not just the near future, but the long-term future? What things do we need to put in place to sustain this? So some of the things we identify to sustain this, we look, let's put programs in place and let's get people, let's get people involved and engaged. And this term that we're using today was critical, being inclusive, not just inviting people to the table to have a conversation about where we should be in the future, but actually having them become a part, which means in the leadership ranks and, and the various organizations where the decisions are being made on the various panels, et cetera, to ensure that there were individuals a part of that 
and that it was conducive to allow them to grow up in the organization, become a part. Because once you're engaged, once you feel you're a part of something, then you contribute yourself fully to that. And then it just creates a, a, a groundswell of opportunities for people who are on the outside looking in, people who are on the inside looking at. It just, it's, it changes up the dynamics. So if we can take this momentum that we have right now, the spotlight that's on the international, national slash comp corporate stage, turn on little lights to ensure to identify those things that are working in the organization, highlight those, those and identify those spaces where we need to clean up and work on those. I think we can get this thing kind of sustained. But don't just, don't identify a point where we can say we have arrived or celebrate success before the game is over. You know, it's it maybe the fourth quarter, you know, with two minutes to go and you may be ahead, but you don't stop there. I mean, you've, you've seen how that, that plays out. <laughs> As someone who identifies as white, I've just realized this is a lifetime of work ahead of me to always recommit and refocus. I'm in deep in my understanding and I'm just, you know, I have 15 year old twins at home and that is very motivating for me to make sure I get it right um, with that next generation of, you know, nieces, nephews, my own kids that I'm raising right. um, with a very different lens. Under, um, Dave, any other thoughts from you on how to keep this movement, this momentum going within an organization? Yes, I've definitely noticed in conversations that I'm having with clients that I'm working with that people are definitely more conscious and aware and empathetic. And then also a lot more aware about the personal impacts and also their personal education and where they are personally with what's happening around us. Because as leaders, we bring ourselves to organizations. So we want to see organizational change, but for organizational change to occur, we also have to be changed. So that's something that I'm definitely seeing. I'm also seeing that leaders are being held accountable. And with that, there's also the pressure of really being educated yourself. So brands and companies are being held accountable. CEOs are being held accountable and leadership teams are being held accountable. There's also now pressure from the media. And because media is also business, the media industry is now hiring diversity, equity and inclusion editors and writers. So the conversation isn't going to end today. It isn't going to end in three months. It's going to be a continuous conversation. And now there are people who are focused on keeping the conversation going. So I think that's also going to add pressure for all of us to continue to keep ourselves accountable. It's interesting. We also received a couple of um, you know, clients reaching out. It was an early June, and they said, like, we wanted to spring into action. So we tried very much to put out a comms piece. And um, we botched it, and we actually received a lot of um, angry feedback from our employees. Mm -hmm. We want to get it right again, or we want to get it right um, the next time. And I, you know, and, and I wanted to hold space for where they were, but again, I think it's so important to sit in that discomfort, just to realize that there's so much learning to do. And these leaders had nothing but positive intent. Um, but I think that it's about if you do go forward as a brand, as a company, as a leader, and you have an oops moment just to say, um, I'm learning, please give me the space and grace. I really want to get this right. And I'm just open to the feedback so that I continue on my path. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's also, um, it's a form of a microaggression to micro invalidate and to say that all lives matter and I don't see color because now you're dismissing and you're negating that something exists. Mm -hmm. So as you know, leader, in the diversity space, you know, and being conscious of uh, microaggressions and unconscious bias, like that, that's a micro invalidation. Mm -hmm. And to your point, Sandra, I mean, I'm hoping most organizations do know those terms, right? Um, bias is not just unconscious, there's conscious, but also microaggressions and micro inequities, behaviors and words uh, that literally derail and belittle a variety of demographics in an organization and some people just aren't as familiar with the little nuances. So this is where accountability is also owning your mistake and fixing it, apologizing and fixing it, right? Accountability is critical and we have seen an increase in accountability. Now this can get overwhelming for leaders and managers as well as us DEI practitioners um, in the corporate world and outside as consultants. So, you know, we, we talk about sort of goals that lead to a larger goal. Um, so some of the goals are, are simple. If you're not familiar, you need to be educated, you get overwhelmed with what should I do? 
Um, well, one of the things is if you have ERGs, join it. Join one you're not familiar with. Get an understanding of life experiences from another lens. And you know, right now, Black Lives Matter is, is in the forefront. Uh, transgender issues is in the forefront based on what's been taken away and uh, rights and freedoms and healthcare. Like these are critical things that, that impact people. And if they impact someone's life, they impact their work productivity. So it does go to an ROI, but to keep engaged, it's understanding better. And you know, one of the clients we worked with, I um, wanted to have dialogues. And you know, it is important who leads the dialogues, right? That you're not there to tell your story, you're there to listen to other people's stories. So start with something like a YouTube clip and have two questions around it. And you know, I will say that as far as Black Lives Matter goes, the three YouTube clips from P and G are awesome. The yeah. talk the choice, the look. And you can get simple two questions on what resonated with you. Absolutely. What was your emotional reaction, mm -hmm. right? And then figure out what can we do. But, but the education piece gets overwhelming for men. Like you don't have to read all the books, but you know, there are a lot of articles. We've mentioned several today. There are a ton of YouTube clips. Um, I had mentioned last time that, you know, we have to understand that inclusion is a choice that we make to either include or exclude. And diversity is a fact to leverage. Do we have the diverse demographic, the diverse mindset in the room for our business? Because our employees are also our consumers. So let's get that intersectional lens for what we're trying to do. Absolutely. So on that, I, um, um, and again, just a quick hack, as, you know, as leaders who might be new to these conversations, they might, with a new ear, a new lens, notice a microaggression, notice a micro-invalidation. So companies also are asking us, you know, how do we quickly upskill our HR people and our managers so they can handle those moments and address them as they happen so that employees who are Black, employees who are people of color don't have that same, um, you know, um, beh behavior towards them. Uh, but it's all, it's all unfolding real time. So on the topic of um, employee feedback, this was a question that came up back in August. Do you find success in your travels through employee surveys, focus groups, listening circles, town halls? What is the most effective way in this pandemic moment to get that very needed feedback? I know we've had lots of clients, so, we've done a lot of listening circles, we've kind of done all these things and I'm just wondering what you've seen um, to be the most effective as well. I think we're sitting here honoring each other and waiting for each other to make the <laughs> comment. So let me just jump in and then I can free the two of them to go ahead and start. The, uh, I think w w the feedback is important and what we've discovered, we discovered is doing this, particularly during this time, creating a venue where people can have a conversation without judgment and also allow the, as you mentioned earlier, Jamie, about allow a mistake. I mean, it's okay when I'm trying to do the right thing to make a mistake in an effort. I think one of the things, if, if, if I'm doing something, there's a very good chance I'm going to make a mistake. And I think error is a way of a process of learning the process. So if you can, learning as well, if you can create the venue to have the dialogue, to get the feedback and hear what people are saying. Now, I, I would caution saying, taking everything as this is a problem or this needs to be solved. It's hearing everyone get the kind of, there, there's a common thread. And I, this is important to know each organization, you have to look at to yourself to determine what works for you. There's a common thread of issues, possibly in organization A, that may not be common in organization B. So if you have a feedback session to identify what they are, it may be, you may identify a hundred things that may be issues to a thousand people. You're not gonna solve a hundred things, but maybe there's three issues that seem to come up to predominate in that, that dialogue, those may be the area, that may be the area where you start to do your work and have your biggest impact. So it is critical during this time having that. Talking, mm -hmm. Ricky, I'm thinking I was out walking this morning listening to the fabulous Hamilton soundtrack and there's a song, um, I'm not gonna sing it for y'all, but it's like, look around, look around, isn't it wonderful to be alive right now? There's kind mm -hmm. of change and revolution happening. And I thought, you know what? 1776 or so doesn't feel so different than 2020 at some moments because I think that there's nothing but opportunity to get involved in the massive change um, that's happening on so many levels for us as humans and obviously in the workplace. Uh, Sandra, Dave, any thoughts on that in terms of the most effective ways to gather employee feedback? 
Yes. Uh, so what I found has worked really well for me as a consultant working with larger organizations, definitely small group sessions. So the listening circles are amazing. And what you also find is that department by department, the concerns, the hurdles, the obstacles may be a little different. So that's a great way to gather information and to also gather um, details and insight on the personality of the organization, but then also each department. One thing that I've also done is also office hours. So going back to that standing meeting on the calendar is creating both office hours and then also just a time block where people can come in and block 15 to 30 minute sessions is there something you want to talk about? But you just know that on Fridays between this window and that window, I'm open and available. Holding space. On Fridays, no one joins. But there are other Fridays and I'm totally completely booked and it's great. Uh, and it could just be a vent session or you might just need to bounce uh, an idea off of how do you approach something or I want to speak to someone or I want to check in on someone. How do I do that? What's the best way to do that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there are um, informal and informal processes for this, right? The informal is the one-on-one, -on -one, and Megan put that in the chat, really critical. And you know, the trick is, you know, do you have a culture of open feedback? A lot of companies do not. Some leaders don't want to hear the feedback, so they're not asking your one-on-one. -on -one. So in addition to work, how are we doing? Are you getting what you need? Am I giving too much direction? Am I giving... Am I micromanaging too much? Am I giving you enough guidance? To tell me how we're working together, right? This is part of the crux of my experience as an employee in an organization that supports me or doesn't support me. But if you don't have a leader that is open to the dialogue, it's not personal, it's professional, right? And as long as you have your ground rules, we don't attack, it's not a debate, it's sharing information based on our experiences. And you set your ground rules, whether it's a one-on-one -on -one or a staff meeting. Now those are informal. The formal, of course, employee engagement surveys are huge. Just make sure your questions get to the outcomes you're looking for. Read every single question on the survey from your vendors, right? But then what's critical, we did at American Express when I was there was focus groups after the survey. And I, as an HR business partner, was responsible for coordinating all the data, looking at the gaps, and then having focus group sessions so I could get solutions from people who filled out the survey. And my performance rating, along with the support of the business unit I did, was did you make an impact on those scores? When we talked about quotas earlier, we're not big on quotas on hiring numbers, but we're big on quotas on did you improve your engagement survey results? That's a quota. By what percentage? Do people feel more included now a year later after we learned all this stuff and implemented these policies and practices or no. So again, it is, there's formal and informal, you need both. And again, we always talk about resource groups, um, but you know, having intimate dialogue is really important to get to the truth of someone's experience without taking it personally. Just then how do we listen, learn, support, now address and take action. And get back to folks on what, on what occurred after they were addressed. Oh. You and I both grew up at American Express, as did Kate Shrinsky, um, who's about to um, walk us through some of the Q&A. And I always am so um, impressed with the Amex diaspora. They kind of wove so many beautiful best practices into a lot of um, the way that we approach HR. So Kate, with that, I, I see there's lots of questions and comments in the chat. I'm going to um, pass things over to you so you can walk us through. I think you're on mute. So sorry, I unmuted on the computer, but not on my phone. Okay, um, okay I was saying I have some great questions from the chat and I'm gonna try and pick one that is a good segue from the conversation we were just having here. So um, we had a lot of discussion on listening circles, dialogue, the way that we can bring people together. So I'm gonna combine a couple of questions here. Um, Mauricio asked, to please comment on the best practice of listening sessions, which he called dialogue circles. Um, they've been doing many and they've been well received because they are powerful, cathartic, and therapeutic. So first part is what advice do you have on conducting these and what do you do with the information you get? And then Simonia asked kind of a follow-up to that, that where she said, what I'm finding is that people 
coming to these events are people who are already open to DEI? And do you have thoughts on how to reach those who are less interested in learning or growing in the workplace? Um, so, Ricky, can I throw this one to you, please, to start? Sure, sure, sure. So one of the things that we did with this, one I would say is it's important to have senior leadership in the circle for the dialogue. One of the things we did in the organization, because we were focused on changing the dynamics or the, the makeup of the leadership rank, was we put the leadership in the conversation with outside thinkers, great thinkers on this subject, with other senior leaders so they could comfortably have the conversation and really just be free to talk. Because if you mix it and have leaders in with junior officers, then there is a risk of junior officers not being, you know, as, as open, open or, or, you know, leaders dominating conversation. But when you put them in, you, it's an opportunity for them to be completely transparent and to share their thoughts and their challenges around the subject. We, it was an enriching conversation, an enriching dialogue, because they really shared we want, there was some that we really want to do this, but I have no idea about how I go about it. This is what we tried. This is what it's felt. And it was quite uh, informative, but also on both ways, because they learned tools and mechanisms, et cetera, et cetera. And the second part of the question, give me the second part again. The second part was around um, employees who come to these listening circles who are already open to DEI and how do we reach those who are less open? There is, there is a tendency to have that to do, because those who are comfortable do come. But so I found that one of the things we did, we made sure we communicated out what was taking place in the circles because a lot of times, a lot of good things are happening in organizations, but it's happening behind closed doors and that information never gets outside of those doors. So finding and identifying a way to communicate that to the workforce by it, be it at the senior level, level, organization level or office level becomes critically important. And then letting people know at time who's involved. We identified ways to highlight. We had to highlight kind of what Jamie does with, uh, with Inspire, we have individuals, we highlight individuals that are doing great things around us to kind of tell their story. It, it's about way of inspiring others to become involved by seeing the impact of what others are doing. Yeah, I, I want to add on to that, Kate, and to Ricky, um, and I'm just going to use your last words of inspiring people to get involved, uh, creating social accountability by definitely getting a leadership involved from a top-down approach, not necessarily to always be involved and in the meetings, but for them to be aware of the meetings and for the organization to know that senior leadership is aware this is happening. Um, from a feedback loop perspective as well, one thing that has worked really well for a client of mine is creating a diversity council and then also a culture connections team. And one person who represents the culture connections team joins in on these small group discussions that can also bring back feedback to the greater group. This collective feedback is then bubbled up to the senior leadership team. So now it creates senior leadership presence without senior leadership actually having to be there. And then it also creates a bridge and some form of anonymous feedback as well. And Sandra, I love that. That's, that's because, a great idea. Uh, some, of the, uh, some of the clients I work with that are nonprofit or smaller size organizations, they don't have enough people for various employee resource groups. So they create, um, diversity and inclusion committees or councils to your point and councils don't equal all executives right they can be mixed level depends on who's interested and has skill to actually focus on inclusion equity and diversity um, and, and that has worked well in a lot of the smaller organizations i've worked with you know and the point is what are their experiences and share that knowledge and and a check-in with someone from the c-suite occasionally quarterly with these meetings so that they are hearing the dialogue so they actually can create change. But I do think that's, I, I love uh, committees, councils, and I like changing the names, right? People and culture is an awesome name for a committee around diversity and inclusion because it is about people, multitude, intersectional, it is about culture that we're trying to evolve. So that is awesome. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, everyone. These are, these are all great ideas. Um, Diana File asked a question that's <clears throat> related as well. Um, so in her work as a data scientist, she's been improving her suite of employee surveys of DEI outcomes. What kinds of pivotal questions do you think companies today need to be asking their rank and file employees? And how might these questions be different from what we ask senior managers? 
in a survey context. Anyone want to jump in? Otherwise, well, starting I'll start to you. Uh, sure. Starting out, I mean, one of the critical things is about data and, and surveys is, you know, the self-selection of how I identify myself. Because one of the critical questions is, um, fill in the blank, I have my voice heard, I feel supported, I feel championed in this organization. So I fill in the blank, I as a gay man feel this way, I as a minority, whatever, uh, female, fill in the blank of the demographic. But if we're not registering, please self-select how you identify yourself, then we can't actually look at the results based on demographic. So I'm gonna partner that because that is critical. But one of the, one of the questions we ask in many focus group is, you know, fill in your blank on who you are in your intersectional lens. Do you feel you have the tools to do your work, supported by your manager and championed? And let's talk about those experiences. And I think that's one of the most important questions on a survey and a focus group to get to the grit of what's the unwritten rule that people find are obstacles and barriers that we need to get over. So, so I would just add, uh, Diane, she said, I, I stumped you all. Thank you, Diane. I, said, I think maybe she did, maybe she did. But really what the, the challenge was you asked for a specific question. And I think what happens, one size doesn't fit all, and organizations, when they're doing their survey and their questions, they really need to focus on the issues facing that organization and tailor their questions to that and not be shy or not shy away from the issues. Oftentimes, we ask questions that have very little relevance to the issue we're trying to address. But I would say when you, when you get on this topic, really dial in your questions to the issues that you want to get at. And, and as, as Jamie said, oh, let's be willing to be uncomfortable. So true. Thank you, guys. Um, speaking of unwritten rules, uh, mentorship and sponsorship are so critical to learning those unwritten rules and to getting new opportunities in the workplace. <clears throat> so I'm going to ask for some personal stories here. Um, could you each share an experience you've had with a mentor or one where you've served as a mentor to someone else and tips you might share on getting one or contributing to that relationship? Sandra, could I start with you? Sure. So one tip I love to give out about mentorship is all your mentors don't really need to know that you're, you're, they're your mentor, but then also in that spirit that everyone should have a personal board of directors. So if we're managing ourselves as brands and we're really the CEOs and the CMOs of our own selves, then one thing all great companies have is a board of directors. So why not create one for ourselves? So you may have a go-to person that um, is able to give you all the information you may need about finances. Someone who you can go to to give you um, all or great advice around career um around family even that right it's so important so pick different people in your life that you can have that can give you great feedback and you don't necessarily have to ask for them to mentor you but they could just be that person that gives amazing advice in a certain area um, i personally would not be here without amazing mentors and then also sponsors and one other thing to know is that a lot of decisions are being made about us that impact us when we're not even in the room. And for that reason, it is important that we also cultivate relationships that can advocate and sponsor us when we're not even in the conversation to be able to influence a decision. And that's where sponsorship is really important. Um, so folks that can advocate for you when you, you don't or are not even in the space to have a say. Um, I just had a conversation earlier today with someone who I interned for years ago. We won't say how many years, but she's someone that I've continued to cultivate a relationship with. And now she's in a senior uh, decision-making decision and we're a uh, position and we're able to have a different level of relationship, but also the relationship has evolved over time. And I bet she's learning so much from you, right? It's that reverse mentoring that was mentioned earlier, which, which ultimately um, ends up happening. Yep, exactly. So I, I did a, uh, I wrote a book on some of this stuff, but in, in the book, I was chapters on mentors. So I just want to highlight, I still tell a couple of stories. One is, I uh, one impact that my mentor uh, that uh, was a senior officer when I was a junior officer. 
and for, he saw something in me. Uh, and he did something that just kind of was really floored me, which was he took me to the executive suite for lunch. And he would do that once a year just to invite me up. And I was so humbled by the just the just being in the room with this individual and then having him have conversations about me. It inspired me to want to do more. Also in my career, one of the stories I, I recall uh, being a little bit more senior and writing a note to an, another senior officer that made it to a panel when they were discussing me in my absence. Thank you, Sandra, for bringing that up. And he brought it back to me and said, what were you thinking? I said, I think I wrote it down rather clearly. <laughs> and his point to me was you have to, it's better to think sometime about what you have to write and just hold it and, and not commit it to everybody else. And my point is that having someone to give you insights, having someone to inspire you, having someone outside of your working range. I mean, your, your, net, your mentoring group should be just as broad as, as Sandra mentioned, as, as broad as you can make it because people will give you different insights about different things. And then the other part is final part is be sure to carry it forward. And you don't have to wait until you're a senior to do that. I started doing that as a junior officer, helping others. Oftentimes they were even more senior to me. Uh, and it just, it pays itself back in, in, in ways that you can't express. Always, always. I love that. Always paying it forward. Always operate with gratitude. I think we are just at, we got two minutes. So, one final question. Let's do it. Okay. Um, I see one follow-up coming from the chat and, and um, want to ask it since it is pretty timely. So uh, Simonia mentioned the recent decision that President Trump made to mandate the end of un-American diversity training. Um, could you guys share some thoughts on this change and how we can pivot to address these negative connotations? That boils my blood. And I put that in a Facebook post, like it just boils my blood. So, you know, my answer is no, no, you cannot limit people's learning, right? So you can, you can say legislatively whatever you want. Now he's saying for government agencies, he's going to cut back on the training. Well, guess what? I mean, he cut back on the training when he went into office. I used to have a ton of government agency personnel in my Cornell classes. And it went from literally a, you know, percentage of it, 15% of my class were government agencies. Um, and now it's um, less than 1%. So we know that they've already cut it. So, but as human beings, we can learn on our own. And I am hoping that people in government want to learn on their own and they seek out resources. And I, you know, I will do pro bono stuff to keep the learning going, myself included. I learn from others and they learn from me. And this is the whole culmination of what we're experiencing in DEI right now today of our lens and our experiences. So, so my answer is no way. I don't care what you say. We are not going to limit what we do. And this is where I've been tapped on for some keynote speak, speaking engagements for a gay alliance for coaches and other entities where I am happy to do it. No fee because I want to keep the topic at hand and the learning continuing. I love that. And I want to end on that positive note of abundance of just showing up for each other right now as humans and creating more inclusive places and spaces for all of us. I want to thank our fantastic panel again for being with us. And for all of those who have joined, I wish you and your families continued health during this time. And we look forward to seeing you in October. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.